Man, what is good, everybody? It is your boy BQ with your Impact Lounge Impact Wrestling Review for September 19th, 2024. Uh, once again, you are not seeing my face, and I'm going to I'm gonna kind of recap in case you haven't watched the last few or listened to the last few podcasts. Typically, I would review Impact or Pay-Per-View, and you're seeing my face pop up there. But I was explaining that uh, the area that I record in we're basically looking to do something different with uh to use it for a little bit more of a storage area get a pantry uh things like that <laughs> so right now my setup is not really really ideal the way that i look aesthetically so it's just easier for me to keep my face off screen now a lot of you guys have been getting in the comments asking if i have a walk-in closet or something like that I, that i can use and create a new setup um, the answer is yes, but the answer is also no. So I do have a walk-in closet. Uh, it's probably uh, not quite big enough to set up the way that I need to. You know, if it was my wife's closet, that's a different story. I can fucking do whatever I want in there. But with mine, uh, it is a walk-in. It's a little bit tight. But the problem is it is in our bedroom. And my wife spends a lot of time in our bedroom whether she's watching tv she sleeps a lot later than i do um when i record i typically record very very early in the morning 5 30 6 a.m something like that so i can i can be downstairs and i have peace and quiet I use my closet upstairs i wouldn't have that peace and quiet because my wife is if she's home is usually in the room so um we're still I'm, I'm still working on it and um hopefully we'll get get somewhere where i can figure something out but for the meantime uh we'll be recording my podcasts like this and audio quality wise uh once you remove the video it actually sounds a lot better so um that's what it is we're going to talk this episode of impact but i'm going to do things a little bit different this time because i'm actually going to talk about the main event first because it's very relevant to what stood out to me in this episode. I cannot think. I've been reviewing this show for nine years. I have not seen one wrestler from start to finish of an episode get that big of a push as we've seen with Masha Slamovich, where we're taking her from, you know, we're not talking about the men's division, obviously. We're talking about a much smaller women's div division. But we are talking someone who was basically in the mid-card of, of the show. She was wrestling on pre-shows as part of the Knockouts Tag Team champion, Champions. Um, titles that don't matter a whole lot. And by the end of this episode, Masha Slamovich... Meet... Fran Stalinaskovich Davidovitsky has been pretty much elevated to the main event picture of this show. She wrestled in the main event of the show. I mean, the main event picture of this company. She wrestled in the main event of this show. She's likely moving on to Bound for Glory. Now, I've been going back and forth with what are they going to do with Jordan Grace? How is she going to defend a title Bound for Glory? Potentially drop the title. I think she will drop it there. I've been going back and forth with that. But the very first thing that I told you guys was Masha Slamovich made sense for me as the one that Jordan would put over. Now, the problem is Masha Slamovich did not speak English on TV, and it just didn't feel like we could get her there. Not as like the baby face face of the company. I knew she wasn't going to win it as a heel. Because we we would need someone to move into the Jordan Grace spot. I just I, I I got further and further away from that opinion, and then I started saying, well, maybe Kylan King returns, maybe it's her. And then I started saying, well, the knockouts uh, have been re not the knockouts, but uh, NXT has been wrestling. Uh, various NXT wrestlers have been wrestling Jordan Grace for the title, so the story is kind of like, okay, well, someone from NXT is going to come and take the championship the problem is there's not really someone at the of that there's two people julia and um and uh stephanie vicker i don't think it would be julia because right now 
NXT and WWE have not shown that they're going to give their biggest stars over to TNA. They're using it as a developmental <laughs> brand. So I know we're talking about Bound for Glory, but they're not going to give up Julia. Stephanie Vakur, I was like, you know, that's a possibility if it's an open challenge at Bound for Glory. that That is, I would say it's a possibility. It's probably not likely. But now after this episode, I'm kind of back to saying, okay, I, it's only a matter of time before they announce that Masha is wrestling Jordan at Bound for Glory. I think that was the first time they had a match was Bound for Glory several years ago. And uh, Masha got this real, real big push up and up to it, and then she lost. And then very unnecessarily, they had a last knockouts ma- standing match like two weeks later. And when she lost that one, I... I'm I'm very careful with the word buried because that gets overused and, and used incorrectly in wrestling. But when she lost that match, that knockouts, last knockout standing match, it knocked her down several levels in that division. She really went from a bonafide, bonafide main eventer to getting pushed down to the mid card very quickly. So I thought that match was really unnecessary. And then it really kind of took a, a, a while for them to build her back up. And then eventually she gets the tag team titles with Killer Kelly and MK Ultra is the best thing that happened to the knockouts tag team division since they've since the titles returned. Now, Killer Kelly was taken off TV. If you guys didn't hear me a couple weeks ago, I did think it was because she was pregnant because remember she got rolled up very quickly. Um, it just seemed so. It was like okay, everyone's like, "Well, she was pregnant." Uh, if you if you didn't hear her a couple couple of weeks ago, I looked into it. She was not pregnant for that, so we don't know why she was removed from TV. But MK Ultra came to a screeching halt in favor of Spitfire, uh, which is to me a, a huge drop off. But little by little, you know. I would say little by little. They, they've booked her pretty decently. But I mean, she's... I, I think the biggest issue I have with how she's been handled the last couple week, last couple months, is that she's like lost to Jody Threat twice. And you guys have heard me saying there, there's no scenario where Jody Threat should beat this person, especially if they know they're trying to build Masha up, you know, to be a single star, or whatever. Maybe they felt it was necessary for the, t- the um, storyline. For Alicia to to get upset at Masha. But we saw this coming from a mile away. Whenever they lost the belts, they were going to break up. So that's why I was kind of thinking. Um, I had to hit pause really quickly and step away. So I don't remember exactly what I said. So my apologies. But um, my point was, you know, perhaps she had to take a couple of losses. Or they felt that way for the storyline. Uh, to get her to where she needs to be. But really, long story short, the character arc of of one person from the beginning of the show to the very end, I, I haven't seen anything like this since I've covered the company. Um, I, th- I think as far as like a singular episode, someone's popularity rising, I think we saw it years and years ago with Fala Ba uh, when he was wrestling a uh, Austin Aries in the main event of a show for the world title. But then they didn't do anything with them in the next episode. So it's very, it's really not the same, but, but just the, the way they, they truly elevated her from, from one status to another over the course of this episode was incredible. I mean, uh, that was probably, that was the best part of the show. I mean, it was the very first segment, you know, a segment in the middle with Jordan and then main event, you know, now, well, so we'll go to re- really quick here because um, I'm going to talk about the actual main event. But the first thing we get on the episode is Alicia Edwards. Uh, hi, baby. And she's cutting a promo and she is saying how I think she called her Masha Slamowicz cost her the title. So Alicia decided instead of getting their contractually obligated rematch, that she was just going to blow up the team. <laughs> that's that's the way uh the, the story the story works but um masha comes out 
and, and it's and it's scripted as shit because Alicia is talking and then she's clearly waiting for Masha's music to play. Masha comes out and this is like 30 seconds after Alicia talks. So they're hanging out in Gorilla together um, to promote this blood feud. So then she comes out and it is and, and finally Masha Slamovich speaks English. I've, I've talked to Masha before, so I knew she spoke English. But she sounded pretty good. Her her promo skills were there. Like it wasn't like um, you know, she came out and she starts talking. It's like, oh, whoa, let's stop talking. You know what I'm saying? Like uh, like if you watch NWA, the first time Camille started talking, it was like, oh fuck. I go back to being silent. You know what I mean? She did a really good job with this. And they they didn't they didn't make us feel like idiots about it. You know, she didn't just start speaking English and they pretend that she's been doing it this entire time. You know, she said, I've always known English. I've always known what you're saying. So she managed to be in the company for like two years and fool everybody, which is <laughs> kind of ridiculous. Um, I mean, you're going to say not a single person backstage knew she spoke English. But anyway, they did a good job with this. And then um, Tasha Steeles comes out. And attacks her, gets a little heat, and Jordan Grace comes out, and then it's the system. And right here, I'm like, okay, we're getting some kind of fucking bullshit. Which they ended up putting it to, together a good main event here because when I saw this card for this episode on paper, I was not interested. I don't think the card for this particular episode was very good, but they gave us a very nice main event. So, um, once we know we see all these people fighting in the ring, it's like, okay, what what would WWE do? And then it's Santino's music. Sometimes it may be good, sometimes it may be shit. And he has um, let us know that we're going to get a six-man tag team match. It's going to be The System and Tasha Steeles versus The Hard Boys. Because I, I forgot to throw that in there. The Hardys came out as well. The Hardys and Masha Slamovich. So that is going to be um, the main event of this evening. Now, before I get into this actual match itself, I thought this episode looked very, very good. Of course, it kicks off. We get two minutes of slow-mo highlights. I'm falling asleep. But then the episode starts, and you know, after, well, once, we're, once we're into it, once we're a few minutes into this, we see that the crowd is very full. It's lively. It's engaged. And there are episodes of Dynamite that look like this. You know what I'm saying? And I'm saying this in a good way. The, the arena looks full. We see people. We don't see empty seats. It sounds full. There's almost no difference to this episode than some episodes of Dynamite. And there's this episode looked and sounded better than some epi most episodes now of Collision and Rampage where there's nobody there. Sometimes I'll come across AEW highlights on social media. Um, like I was watching the other day, Sky Blue came out. And this is at the pay-per-view. And she's an awful promo. Awful. But she comes out and cuts a promo. And it's like crickets. Absolute crickets. And not because the people weren't reacting to her. They're just nobody fucking there. You know what I'm saying? And we don't. it doesn't sound like that at TNA now. We don't get these guys cutting promos. And it just sounds like they're in an empty freaking arena because that's the way it was for a long time but this looked professional how, how many times did i tell you guys impact needs to look closer to nxt or closer to aew than it does to mlw or nwa now we're there now we're now we're at a point where it looks like those shows it's a matter now of can we get off access tv and can we get and i'm saying we but i'm speaking for the company can we get off access tv can we get a television deal that not only reaches more homes, but pays us a significant amount of money? Or at least some some amount of money. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? So I don't think getting off Access TV is happening anytime soon. And I think a lot of people feel that if they get off Access TV, then now we're doing, you know, 500,000 people and, and things like that watching that. You got to temper those expectations because we know AEW has a much, much larger audience 
and they got 700,000 people watching and they got, they're doing collision and rampage. Now we're doing freaking impact numbers. They're under, under 200,000. So if they were able to get off access TV, I, I could see it maybe getting up to 200. I don't think it's going to get that, that bump that everybody thinks it's going to. It, it could hit three, but if we can get that significant amount of money coming in now, TNA is becoming a major player in the wrestling world. And they're in the same breath as an AEW and they can, they can make legitimate plays for free agents that come out. I know Miro's a free agent right now. Everyone's like, well, come to TNA. He has said publicly before he didn't have interest coming to TNA, but now that AEW is not a thing, I don't think he WWE would take him back. We could see it. (laughs) So, so we'll see. He may have no other option than to do that. But the company is, um, I'm very impressed right now from a, a business standpoint and the way that they're clearly just stepping up. I'm very impressed. And uh, we're going we're gonna to continue to talk, talk about this main event here because, like I said, it was Masha Slamovich and the Hardys against Tasha Steeles and the system of Brian Myers and Eddie Edwards. All right, son, I'm going to need those two hams back. I don't have any hams. Lift up your shirt, son. And this was a really good match. They gave Masha the hearty rub. And that's what I'm talking about from the beginning of the show. She was at one place on the card, and then she was at a different place by the very end of the show. TNA has been doing a very good job booking the Hardys, but they're also pairing them with the Cheeseball Mike Baileys and the Joe Hendrys and and now Masha Slamovich and uh, Santana. They're getting their top stars mixed in with the Hardys to get that Hardy rub because the Hardy gets the Hardys get a reaction, they get a loud pop. So they know what they're doing. And mixing Masha Slamovich in with them was the smartest thing they could have done. Entertaining match. I don't care about the match at this point. The only thing I would have done different here is I would have had Masha win the match and pin Tasha Steels. Too often when the Hardys wrestle it's like, okay, we're going to play the hits. We got to send the crowd home with the Swanton Bomb and the Twist of Fate. Like, I get all that. And for for the most part, that's that's important. And, and it doesn't ruin the match for the Hardys to play the hits. But I would have had Masha win here. Because if they could have gone off the air, the Snowplow, which even though I think is a shit finisher, it, it would have got a huge pop. If they would have, if they want, if they really wanted the Hardys to do the twist of fate and all of that shit, they could have done all that. They could have done the Swanton, and then Tasha Steeles ends up in the ring, take the slow plow, the snow plow, huge pop, and then Masha goes off the air, hands up with the Hardys. Instead, because they had the Hardys win, she was a little bit of a side act as they're going off the air. This is a company I've pointed this out almost since I've started that they have a very difficult time going off the air with someone raising their hand that they don't see as a superstar. The the Hardys have already beat the system. They can already justify a tag team title match. If you can justify Spitfire getting a tag team title match because they pin Ash by Elegance in a handicap match, you can justify the Hardys being in the tag team title picture right now. You didn't have to have them beat the system here. So I really would have had Masha pin Tasha Steels because what is Tasha Steels doing right now? Okay, she's starting to get on TV a little bit, but Tasha Steels could take a pin here and it doesn't hurt her because she's not involved in anything major. So that was the only misstep for me. But again, from the beginning of the freaking episode to the very end, they started creating a star in Masha Slamovich. So I, I just thought, you know, as far as a one episode push, we've just never seen anything like this. Uh, WWE's done stuff like this before, you know, back when I used to watch because I, 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 I had seen it with a few people, but I haven't seen anything like this in, in modern wrestling. And maybe you guys think I'm, I'm very over the top with this, that it was just a regular episode of Impact. But I, I mean, I felt that they, they pushed her to face of the knockouts level with just this episode alone. And it helped that there was a lot of people there and man, Let's let's move on because we're like 20 minutes in, into this thing talking about um about Masha. But 
when Santino came out, Ariana Grace and her fine ass also came out. And she let Jordan Grace know that next week she's going to team up with um, one of her best friends to take on Wendy Chu and Rosemary. Clearly, this is her gimmick where everyone is her best friends. I have a, a friend like this in real life that she she posts every detail, every aspect of her life on Facebook. She's one of those people. Um, every time she posts a, 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 a picture with somebody, or a selfie, it's her best friend. Every time. She's p- posted pictures with me before, and it's like, this is my best friend. I'm like, she's not my best friend. But uh, it, it was just kind of funny, because it, it reminded me of that, because I know a real-life person, <laughs> like what Ariana Grace is doing here. After this, we have Josh Alexander. Um, he is very conveniently standing in front of, in front of blue and red lights. Uh, Eric Young walks up. Those like those times where like the rah-rah speeches and like getting everybody up. Cause like nobody really get motivated off that stuff anyway. But. And big surprise gives them a motivational speech. We're going to talk a little bit more about Josh Alexander later in the show. But when Josh tapped out to his ankle lock, when he lost the C4 spike, it, what were we saying? Like that he was being booked like someone they were expecting to leave the company or someone who, Said he's going to leave the company. Someone on the way out the door. Now, when I reviewed Victory Road, I had said they're probably not going to go this direction. But they could have where Josh Josh Alexander is really like reflecting on himself after those losses where he's losing to his own finishers. He can really reflect on himself and then they can start doing another character arc from there. But I didn't give him credit. I was like, they're probably not going to do that. But that looks like that's what they're doing. So we don't know if he's going to continue as a heel. He could continue as a babyface. But this is very good storytelling here. We've just been so conditioned over the last few years to say, okay, when we see this on TV, it means this. When we see Deanna Prazo taking L's every week, it means she's gone. It means she's done. We have seen them do this before. So our mind goes there immediately and says, Josh Alexander is taking L's with his own finishers, so he's done. But it looks like there's more to that. And I wasn't giving him credit because we don't see that. That's not typically what we see from the company. But we're getting a change. Remember, Scott Demore is not there. We're not, I'm very, we... I, we, we are very programmed to, to for, for Scott Demore booking and what would Scott do? Scott is not there. So it's going to take me a while to break those, those habits and then not think what would TNA do because I'm, I'm so accustomed to one way of them doing it. So now we're getting very interesting. You know, it gets interesting with Josh Alexander. AEW doesn't do this. This is one of the reasons I really lost interest is you have this guy or this girl lose this big match and then it's like they just take them off TV for a bit or they're wrestling again the next week like nothing happened and there's just zero character arc and no one buys into anything. Like you see like the, you know, they got like Anna Jay who's lost like 50 title matches and there's no change to her character. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? So like TNA is doing a real good job here with Josh and I'm very excited to see where this goes. It might mean he goes back to being a baby face, but maybe a more interesting baby face. We'll talk a little bit more in a bit. Masha Slamovich is now walking in the hall. Jordan Grace very conveniently uh, uh, Masha, you know, catches up with her. They're clearly fucking four feet away from each other. They're walking up. Masha knocks on the Hardy's door. They answer immediately. Both of them step out immediately within 30 30 seconds, within a second. Um, They step out and Masha is talking about looking up to them as a a child and she shows a picture with them. We're now getting, we're now, we're now connecting with the Masha Slamovich character in a way we'd never have before. Her speaking English is going a long way towards this. We're, we're starting to connect with her. Like I, Eric Bischoff would be impressed with this because he he 
very often preaches a storyline kind of, and Vince Russo as well, you know, the storyline playing out throughout the show and, and just, you know, not just being one segment or not just being two segments, but, um, you know, really interweaving throughout the show. And it became very clear here when Jordan let her know, I was, I've been hoping you would answer one of these open challenges. It, be, it became very clear that they're probably going this direction for Bound for Glory. Going back to what I said, they should have done, um, but I just didn't trust them to go that direction. So I started, I started veering off myself, thinking again, thinking again, what would Scott do? This is not Scott. So I think that's where they are clearly going with it. After this, we uh, get tag team act- action of first class, which now that it's AJ Francis and Casey Navarro, they are economy class. That motherfucker, that motherfucker back there is not real. And they take on Jobber and Taint, um, the team of Sinner and Saint. We have not seen them in a while. They're talented X Division style type of dudes. I don't remember their names. I think one is something Williams and something Icarus. I, I would probably remember their name. You know, this is kind of why I struggle with, with the Tom Hannafin calling everyone by their last names as opposed to most announcers who just call people by their full names throughout the majority of the match. It's because you're kind of, you know, every wrestler is, is, is their own brand. And when you're just calling them by their last name, they're just, they're just acts in a show. And I, I don't remember what these guys' names are. They did not say their full names enough for me to, um, to remember. Speaking of Tom, cause you know, I'm always going to go on my, my Tom Hannafin rant. I mean, it's, this is just going to happen every episode. First of all, I got asked the question, does barely getting a shoulder up justify for, oh, what a kid. Because if you guys watch the show, I mean, people are barely getting out of pins. And, oh, when I kick out. Like, they're not kicking out, Tom. But anyway, I was going to say, Tom Hannafin, I think, could very much benefit from not knowing the the finishes in advance. Obviously, you want to have some kind of guidelines. to because, because he does a very good job of filling in blanks when we forget certain aspects of a story. You know? But I think he has so many predetermined lines and pre-rehearsed lines and stuff that he's trying to get over that he loses the ability to to come off natural. Uh, I think he could very much benefit from not knowing what a finish is. Because if you notice every time there's a finish, he knows it's coming. So he starts getting into this like pre-rehearsed one-liner as the pin is happening. And then when the... Um, after the match is over, he has some kind of, uh, the system, whatever over Nick Nemeth, you know, like he has, he has these fucking like pre-rehearsed lines. And it always starts from the beginning of the pinfall to the end of the match. So I think he could benefit from just like not knowing who's going to win as a lot of the great commentators have in, in wrestling history. So anyway, economy class takes on Sinner and Saint. And, um, you know, they, they gave him this match. So it's like, we need to give them a win, right? They need to beat somebody at this point, And this is the best team to do it with. So very, very talented tag team. I don't know if I ever see them holding the belts. They need to work on their physique a little. Uh, they, they just, they're just a little small for my liking when I'm watching wrestling, but these guys, these guys are pretty good and we're going to get to them again in, um, a little bit, but I've been saying this, this version of first class just does not, um, just, just, just not my favorite at all. One of Sinner and Saint did a move where he like like um, Steve Macklin used to do the mayhem for all. We kind of have the reverse headlock and pick him up and slam him down. One of them did a move, picking him up in that same reverse headlock and suplexing him all the way over. I don't even know how to really explain what I'm trying to say. He did it to Casey Navarro. 
it was a finisher. That move was a finisher. That was more devastating to me than a lot of the finishers used on the show. Now, of course, he kicks out of two, but it, it just seems like sometimes the, the moves used throughout the course of a match are just better than the finishers. But ultimately, AJ Francis hits the down payment. One of the Sinner and Saint fellows rolls into position for Casey Navarro to hit the big splash. And then we finally see Casey Navarro pin somebody and win a match. It's not a solo match, not a single match, but we've finally seen him, seen what it looks like when he wins. I don't know how long a lot of you guys have been watching wrestling because this is really, this whole sliding in a position, rolling into position that wrestlers do, this has been going on for probably 20 years, maybe longer. When I was young, um, a rest, let's just say Macho Man was going to hit the elbow. He would you know, body slam the person into position, make sure they're in the correct position. And if for whatever reason he, the person is not in the right position, they would just reach down, grab an arm and leg, and drag him and put him where they need to be. That's that's more realistic. It looks better on TV too. And I don't know why wrestlers have gotten a, away from that in the last couple of decades. Instead of purposely rolling into position, which is super phony, just reach down and move the guy. I don't know why they don't do that. Um, after that, we get a Santana promo. And to go back to what I was just kind of saying about dragging someone into position, I feel that wrestling, when it comes off as real, that is when it is at its best. When you start getting fake, start getting phony, and you can do a, a degree of that. I'm not saying the entire show has to be real. We have to suspend our disbelief to an extent. But the more of it that that reflects real life, I think the better it is. Every time Santana talks, it's real, it's genuine, it feels like his actual thoughts, and he's conveying real emotion. Nothing is scripted about Santana when he talks. So they're talking about the Texas death match with Johnny Dango Curtis later. Just real excellent little backstage promo from Santana. Again, very real, very genuine. But as soon as he's done talking, in case you did not need a reminder that we are watching fake wrestling, Tom Hannafin says, Santana is out for blood in the Texas death match. Just go off the air with Santana with that promo. Leave us. Leave us in awe of what he said. But instead we get the fake Tom Anderson voice immediately with a fucking predetermined one-liner. After that, we have... Um, what did we have after that? Gia Miller backstage. Jesus Christ, that's perfect. Of course you're here right now. And she's with her guest right now, Cheeseball Mike Bailey. Cheese. Yeah, didn't we lock you in the dumpster one time? I got out. Gia Miller was recently, I don't know if it was PWI or what, what it was. She was voted like the second best backstage interviewer, which she was very happy about that on social media. She's come a long way. Don't get me wrong from sounding like a fucking robot. She is not the second best backstage interviewer. <laughs> WWE has a couple that, you know, obviously I don't watch the show re religiously, but watching pay-per-views and watching some clips like they they have some girls who are really good. So that was that was like a little shocking to me because I I was even saying they need to remove her from backstage, put her with Ace Austin because if you're going to break up a ABC, if they do, we don't know if they're going to or not. Putting her with Ace Austin is the logical step to me to to elevate Ace. And then you move Sam Laterna in. Sam Laterna was not even on that list. I think Renee Young was number one. Sam Laterna is better than all of them. She's fucking excellent. She's the most natural, gifted backstage interviewer that I've seen. Like, I would love if she was on screen. But good for Gia. I don't agree that she's number two, but good for her because she has come a, a long, 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 long way. She used to be god awful. 
And I remember it pissed me off because she was she replaced someone who was really good. I don't they they I don't remember exactly who she replaced because she's been around for a while, but they had Alicia Alicia Tude and they had um some Gabby chick who was really good too. And I'm trying to think maybe there was another sucks. But over time, she's just just really, 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 really worked on her craft. So she's become she's become very good at what she what she does. I don't think she's number two, but she's she's much, much, much improved. Uh, but Cheeseball Mike Bailey cuts a promo here. Uh, it was boring, but it was better than most of his promos. But they they're talking about the six way tag team match they're going to have next week and. Every time a wrestler gets on there and they're cutting a promos and they're talking about they're one of the best professional wrestlers in the world. They're one of the best professional. Dude, everyone's gimmick cannot be I'm the best wrestler. That is boring. Then we get a digital exclusive backstage with PCO and Steph DeLander. And it looks like I'm going to be retiring this soundbite for about a year until she comes back from surgery. Everybody's been real nice. Well, that's because you have big jugs. And she's telling PCO to to be patient. He wants to get his hands on Matt Cardona. He gets his hands on him every week, but he wants to have a match. And this is just dragging out. Why doesn't Santino just make the match? If we're just talking about like what what would they do in real life? Because we have matches each week that Santino makes for that fucking episode. Or worst case scenario, the next episode. Like, what is taking so long? Why don't these guys fight? This is just taking forever to get where they need to. And it could be Matt Cardona's uh, medical state. Like, is he cleared? Is he not cleared? Or if he's is he halfway cleared? You know, like maybe that's what it is. But it just it just fucking taking forever. Then after this, we get Matt Cardona in the ring, which, I mean, clearly he's cleared because he's wrestling, but I'm just saying maybe they're being careful with him. That's what I'm, I'm trying to say. That's why I said maybe he's halfway cleared. I say that jokingly. Maybe they're just handling him with kid gloves. But we've got Matt Cardona. He goes one-on-one with the convenient store machine, Rhino. No one really wants to see this match. It doesn't last that long. Because Matt Cardona ends up using a steel chair and getting disqualified. And that's what I'm saying. Maybe he's not fully there yet because he is not really wrestling. Like he's wrestling a little, but he's getting a you know a little bit of action in there. But I think they're handling him with kid gloves. That's the only thing that makes sense to me. But he hits Rhino with the steel chair, gets disqualified, the lights go out. It's pacey. And what does PCO do? Choke slams Matt Cardona. This is two weeks in a row he's done this. And I've asked this question every time. Where is the heat? You're, you, we know. And I say we know 99% because I don't know. It's a 99% chance this is going to be like Monster's Ball at Bound for and it's going to be my vote for overbooked shit show. PCO has some very good matches on TV. But if you look at all the pay-per-views, the common denominator of the worst match on the card is usually PCO. Because they have to add all this other horse shit into the match. And they're probably going to do that when they eventually wrestle as well. Because they're probably going to, you know, Khan's going to show up and Fulton and Rhino. And, you know, so so it's most likely going to be a complete mess but where's the heat and how do you even justify something like a no disqualification street fight whatever type of match if if, if PCO keeps getting his hands on him it's not like Cardona is weaseling his way out every week Cardona is ending up on his ass so I'm just I'm like really over this I've been saying it lately I'm just I'm, I'm very 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 over this and you know PCO after lays them out goes for the PCO salt. Like, why are you going for a wrestling move when you're trying to just attack someone and hurt someone? 
But then he takes the chair and does a PCO salt onto the chair and starts punching it. I thought for a second Rhino was going to spear PCO, that he was going to turn on him. Because Cardona's looking for monsters, you know what I mean? What bigger monster than the convenience store machine? But no, uh, he's going to continue to be the best man beast. Then after that fiasco, excuse me while I cough. I hit pause for that cough. That felt really, really good getting that out. Whew. Anyway, the next match is Spitfire. Tell me right now that I'm just a job. Tell me to my face. You're just that- a job. And Ariana Grace has given him the opponents of Kendall Gray and Carly Bright from NXT. And talk about two women that you just cut out of a magazine and put into a ring. Talk about two creator wrestler looking chicks. I w- I, these two girls could literally show up on my screen every week and I would not recognize them out in public. They are, they are two of the most generic looking females I have ever seen in my life in a wrestling ring. That being said, one thing I will say about the NXT women's division is that they are pretty good about each woman having each woman having their own move set, which is very different from something like AEW, where everyone's doing the same moves for the most part, and TNA to an extent too. I've called them out for multiple people doing pile drivers and cutters and and things like that. NXT is pretty good about you're going to have your move set. You understand what I'm saying? They're not all sharing moves. So one of the girls, I believe it was the Kendall Gray lady, was, I think they said she was an amateur wrestler. So she was showing something very different. She said, they said, you know, Matt Raywall um, on commentary, like Matt Raywall does annoy me, don't get me wrong, just because of his voice. But he actually is pretty good. And I don't like when he switches back and forth between heel and babyface. But he, he's pretty good, actually, for the most part. Hey, man. I really appreciate that Patrick Price on my insurance, Jake, from State Farm. And um, so they were saying, like, she wrestled with the dudes. And, and she was showing some some moves. Very different, again, what, like what I said. Very different from what we see from females. And then her partner, Carly Bright, this said she was a competitive cheerleader or something. Which we've known. WWE has tried to turn those people into wrestling athletes in the past. And she, she did a couple somersault flip things that were, that had her own spin on them. They had, you know, they, they were, they weren't bad. Like these were not bad wrestlers. The match was not good because Spitfire is not that good. Uh, there was a lot of on both, on both ends on Spitfire and on Kendall Gray and Carly Bright. There was a lot of getting in position, obviously getting in position for moves and waiting for moves and and uh, just choreographed spots that they were telegraphing in advance. Uh, like, for instance, one of them was one of the NXT girls was jumping off the second rope to do a hur- hurricanrana and and uh, Danny Luna stood there with her arms out to catch her for, for a good like five seconds before she jumped. So it, it was like you knew what move was coming. So overall, the match was not good it was clunky but i thought the nxt girls had a little bit of talent i mean these are developmental girls but they they showed something different uh but spitfire gets the win and when i was saying that the storyline seemed like jordan grace would lose to someone in nxt i'm starting to think that spitfire or the tag team championship in general will change hands and they will lose to someone from nxt that is something I think is a little more realistic because Telegraph and Tom is keep saying they would be the first person from NXT to win a TNA championship. He says this a lot. That means it's going to happen at some point. Someone is going to win a TNA title from NXT. I don't think it's going to be X Division. I don't think it's definitely not going to be the world championship. I don't think it's going to be the knockouts championship anymore. Even though I said it would be a very interesting storyline for Jordan Grace to lose to someone from NXT, join NXT, and then continue to wrestle for the title and do both shows. That would be very, very interesting. I think that is very much over the heads creatively of of something they would even attempt to do or even think to do. 
but someone from NXT is winning a championship from TNA. And I think this is going to be it. And the thing is, you don't have to send them stars. It can be a couple NXT randos. Um, I'm trying to think. There, there, there's man. There's one team. I think JC Jane, and 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 someone has a partner. It, or not, someone has a partner. She has a partner who was someone I don't quite remember, but I can see I can see a scenario here where actually. Uh, whatever they do, a bound for glory. Spitfire loses the title to NXT, so we'll see if that's what they do. Uh, after that, we had Ash by Awful Sauce backstage with the personal. We know him as the as the Ice Man. That's my dad, but don't worry, he's cool. Really? He <laughs> doesn't look cool. And then when he moves out of the way, we see, which I thought was kind of funny, we saw Heather Reckless. He has an erection. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's all her fault. What I did not like about this was that, number one, it was bad comedy. But number two, when at Victory Road, it wasn't, no, no, I'm sorry, it wasn't Victory Road. It was the actual episode of Impact where she helped Ash by Elegance win, and then they go backstage, and Ash is saying, huh. You know, she, she's thinking about the idea of someone to help her. And then the personnel, personal, I always call them personnel, the personal concierge. Let's play one more time. That's my dad, but don't worry, he's cool. Really? <laughs> he doesn't look cool. But he gives her his card, and it says, you know, contact me for a, make, a makeover. And then Heather Reckless, of course, Tom Hannafin calls her Reckless, like that's her last name. Heather Reckless does show up to take him up on the offer. And they're not interested. They're blowing her off. To me, that is, they are, when when they were comparing Ash by Elegance to, what the fuck is there in AEW? Tony Storm, which we know that the gimmicks are very different. But there are some similarities. Like, this is another similarity. Like, Tony Storm trying to blow off Mariah May at one point. Now they're doing that with this. And I thought it was... I mean, we've got to see where the story goes. But I, I just thought it was unnecessary. Because we know they're going to team up. So why not just start fucking building this thing right now? You can't go from one week saying, Oh, you know, the, the thought of some help. And contact me for a makeover. And then they show up and we're like, we're busy. And Heather Reckless asked him to watch her match next week. The same fucking thing that Mariah May did on AEW to Tony Storm. You ask how I know this when I always say I don't watch AEW. I do watch clips and I do listen to the Jim Cornettes of the world reviewing the show. But I've seen the clips because I've always liked Mariah May. So I had, in, I had interest in her when she showed up there. And to see what she was doing. And obviously Tony Storm was doing some very entertaining things. So I'm watching these clips on YouTube. It is the same story. So I was very upset with that. I was very, not upset. It's not that fucking serious. But I mean, I was just very disappointed that they're kind of going that direction instead of just building the team. Heather Reckless is not a good promo. And I told you guys a week or so ago that Gail Kim is being very, very picky with who she brings on. And although I think Heather Reckless is very good in the ring, I've said that she's excellent. She can't talk. So I'm not understanding being picky because if you're going to be picky, then someone should be TV ready when they show up. That's the way, that's the way I see it. You know what I mean? Like if you're not just going to bring in people to bring them in and you're, you're going to sit here and be very selective, they should be able to come in and not sound like they're reciting rehearsed lines. But I don't know. It, it's her first time on TV, from what I understand. But she she has the potential to be, you know, um, to do very, very well in this company. I think her and Zaya Brookside, I'm very high on both of them. So she wrestles Zaya Brookside next week, as a matter of fact. Then we get the Texas death match of Santana. That's nasty. Versus JDC. These are spirit figures. I'm sorry, I have to play that one more time. These are spirit fingers. And these are gold. 
I had to give you the full sound clip there. I accidentally stopped the recording for a second. I don't know. I was fat fingering what I'm doing here. But it but it's a Texas death match. It is no DQ, no rules, falls count anywhere. I'm here to tell you right now, we don't care. Let me tell you. Right, let me tell you <laughs> we don't care. So on paper, I don't fucking care. Like I hate these matches. All right. That said, this is what a hardcore match is supposed to look like. I don't like hardcore matches in no way, shape, or form. I don't care what you call them. I don't care if it is a freaking Las Vegas street fight and it's up the road. I don't care if it's in my backyard. I don't like these matches. I don't care. There was a point here where JDC hit a power bomb, Santana, a power bombs Santana on two upright chairs. The most it was more devastating than any move we had seen in the night. It got a two count. It was some AEW horse shit because that's where Santana came from. That I didn't, I wasn't a big fan of. But to go back to what I just said, this is what a hardcore match is supposed to look like. And these are real Texas death match rules. You got to win and then they got to stay down for 10, which is weird because it's not that much different than a last um, last man standing, but it just, it seems like this would be much more difficult to, to win because you really have to keep them down for like 13 seconds, but whatever. But this, you know, the, the, the heat they got on each other, the, the blood, the moves they did outside the ring. Like this is what, when you say anything goes, this is what we should get. We should we should get an all out brawl like this. This was for what it was, very very good. I didn't think it was necessary for the story. I know he wanted some revenge on JDC, but Texas Death Match is kind of wild to me. Like that's kind of a lot, but um, that's where they want to go with it. The only reason it's a Texas Death Match and and not a San Antonio street fight. It's because there's already a name for a, a match like this, but believe you me, if this was in Chicago, it would be a Chicago street fight. It would be a Nashville street fight. It would be a Tallahassee street fight. That that's what this was. They, they conveniently were in Texas. They were able to do a Texas, Texas death match. But to go back to what I was saying, even though I have like zero fucking interest in these kind of matches, this was as good as it could have been. And it got a real reaction from people, so I hope that um, I hope that people liked it because they freaking put their bodies on the line. But I, I was just I was not a fan of Santana taking that power bomb onto two upright chairs. That's you. He you. This is a guy you are trying to. You basically let us know he's going to wrestle Moose and he's going to be the world champion at one point. You are telegraph these things to us. These are very very big deals, and you do a move like this where he could legitimately get freaking hurt. So not a fan of that at all, but, um, but pretty good match for a, for a, uh, for a hardcore match after the match moose comes out. And, um, you know, this is kind of the, like the fake, the, the fake shit I'm talking about with Tom, just, he's assaulting him with a chair. I, I mean, if this were like Jim Ross, in the freaking early 2000s like he would he would be conveying real like someone get a ref out here someone get get this this guy just wrestled a match get him out of, get this guy out of here you know like he wouldn't be calling it like he was calling a match you know like you you show actual outrage not not freaking fake outrage and then it shows Sinner and Saint backstage they're still selling 30 minutes later but at least they're selling cuz they they have people on this show who wrestle 15 minutes prior to their segment and they're selling jack shit when you come across them. So at least they're selling Josh Alexander comes up with a real half-hearted pep talk, almost like he's doing the right thing because he thinks that's what he's supposed to do, but he doesn't know if that's what he wants to do. So this is a very interesting character progression for Josh Alexander. And these, these two guys, they could be building a modern day team angle. You know what I mean? Like maybe these guys are going to um, join up with Josh. 
Maybe they're going to become heels. They're all heels. They're all baby faces. I don't know. But I, I know I'm interested in it. Then after this, we get another. Um, we, we know her, I guess, as Zia Lee. But it uh, looks like she's going to be Lei, Lei Ying Lee. And I, man, I hope I didn't fucking fuck that up. But very good backstage, uh, not backstage, but video package for the previous Zia Lee. And whether Bill Goldberg, let me tell you something about Bill Goldberg. Then after this, this was a little boring for me, but this is Joe Hendry in the ring. And then Frankie Kazarian comes out and then Nick Nemeth comes out and he hits him with the WWE. Will you shut the hell up? The the Seth Rollins, you know what I'm saying? When you got nothing, you just tell your opponent to shut up. This was real WWE to me. I didn't really care for this. And then I said, oh my God, we're getting a three-way about for glory after, or aren't we? Because they're in there and they're talking forever and I'm I'm really not that interested in, in what they're saying. And then Santino's music. Hits. Sometimes it may be good, sometimes it may be shit. And he said that next week we're gonna get a number one contenders match between Frankie Kazarian and uh and, and Joe Hendry. The, I, I feel pretty confident in saying this is gonna be a three way abound for glory. Without knowing spoilers. I don't think that we're gonna get a finish. It's some pretty good long-term booking because remember Frankie Kazarian tossed him at NXT and and good old Mike Gilbert always says, why does Joe Hendry not care about Frankie Kazarian? They were kind of laying groundwork for a a feud a little bit a while ago. A little bit a while ago. Does that make sense? A little while ago, they were kind of laying the groundwork for a feud. Didn't quite happen. Frankie Kazarian made it to the end at Slammiversary. Like they're they're tying some things together but and, and they're doing a good job with it. But I'm pretty confident this is going to be a three-way. I don't see Nemeth versus Joe Hendry because I don't think they want to beat Nick Nemeth. Um, if Joe Hendry wins a title, I think they would rather he beats Frankie Kazarian. We'll see what happens. I would love to see Frankie Kazarian win the freaking title, to be honest with you. Just kind of pull a Chris Jericho when he beat the Rock and Stone Cold in the same night and no one, everyone just thought he was a throw-in for the match and then he wins a title. If they do a three-way, I would actually like to see that. The King, Frankie Kazarian. It's a block party. I'm not playing with y'all, bro. That soundbite for block party is because you are not a real fan of TNA if Frankie Kazarian hasn't blocked you on Twitter. Um, so it's a, it's a block party up in this uh, up in this bish. But yeah, this just really did very little for me. Um, it doesn't really excite me for Brown for Glory. But I assume that's where they're going a three-way. We'll see if that's what they do. So I ran a little long today because I was very impressed with how they handled Masha Slamovich this episode. And we'll see if next week that she like continues to get that push. I'd be very, very interested to see what they do. But um, yeah, on paper, I just didn't think this was a good card. But... The episode was not bad. The episode had a lot of redeeming qualities to it. The ones I saw Cardona and Rhino and a Texas death match and first class this version of first class that I have no interest in. I was like, this is one of the worst cards they have put together this year, if not the worst. But then they brought in a really good main event that kind of, that kind of saved it. And then obviously just the Masha stuff in general was very, was very good. That's going to do it for me, folks. We're hitting 59 minutes. I am your boy, BQ. I am out. Peace.